Hey everybody, it's Bill with Let's Talk Dubs. On this video that we have today is gonna to be about my Type 34 Gia, my second Type 34 Gia project. You guys may remember my first Type 34 Gia project. It was on the cover of Hot VW's November 2009, uh, gray 65 Type 34 Gia, and it was on Cosmic Wheels, original Cosmics, 2.6 liter Type 4, and quite a bit of custom touches. Uh, finished by Buddy Hale for me, had him I had a paint job on it the first time that just was not what the car needed. It was a project where I'd built it so far that I was so deep in it money-wise that I couldn't, it didn't make sense to clip corners at all. You know, so that car ended up being a mega car. I ended up having about 90,000 bucks in that car when it was all said and done. When I sold it, I sold it for $70,000. The guy who bought it then threw it online was asking 140,000 for it. So. I think he's down to a hundred grand or a hundred to five thousand for it right now, but uh, he took, got rid of the really rare, super cool Cosmics and threw Porsche alloys on it. So it looks like a like everything else with Porsche alloys on it. So anyway, this video is about my project Zorba the Gia. Now you might say, Bill, why did you sell a Gia and then buy a Gia again? Well, part of the problem with maybe the challenge, more like it, is when you build a car that's a mega car and you have so much money invested in it, you end up having different feelings about these cars. You know, it's not, um, I don't wanna say that, I don't know, I, don't, I think maybe it's more, you, when you build a show car like that, that's up to that level, you're really concerned about where you're parking it, where you're driving it. I mean, I drove it like stank. I mean, there's videos out there online showing that I slid that thing sideways. I didn't, you know, I mean, I drove it good because it, you know, the setup on that car was, uh, 2.6 liter type 4 Berg 5 speed, uh, four wheel disc brakes, leather interior, um, anything I could get best of the best. And I just, it, it got so deep that there was, I couldn't go halfway at that point. So I threw it up for sale thinking, oh, we'll just throw this up for sale, see what happens. And it sold. And when you have a buyer on a car that's that high of a level, you know, like I said, I had about $90,000 in building it which in today's standards is pretty cheap. And that was accounting every mistake, every repaint, every everything that I had to do. Um, and all the parts that I bought that were duplicates and whatnot are what I built the carbon cab with. And I'm gonna do a whole video on the cars that I own now. Uh, one for each individual car going through the build, uh, the, the specs, a drive along, all that good stuff. So uh, expect to see those coming up here soon. We got I got a lot of videos to put out. So, But this one specifically is about my new Type 34 gear project. So. I don't know. Again, it was just the, th the things lined up and then I sold it. And probably the day when it was driving away, I regretted selling it. Um, and what I remember about Type 34 Gia is they're really, really the best driving Volkswagen that's out there. Prove me wrong, right? I mean, they've got the Type 3 suspension, which is by far the best. Volkswagen engineered the Type 3 as, a, as an upgrade from the Type 1. Uh, and it's definitely a car that handles better. It's wider, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy, so I like to fit in a car with space. And that car is Volkswagen sports car. Sits low, balanced front to back, looks good. Visually, you got the fishbowl effect with the little tiny you know, B pillars and stuff. And it's just, a, it's just a super rad car. And so right after I sold it, I really regretted it. And matter of fact, the blue car that I had, I was in talks with uh, Jason from Ross Wolf about trading the gray car for his blue car plus cash. And we just couldn't meet at a number because I thought, well, I, I'd like to build another one because maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment. And then I end up acquiring that car. So I paid 15,000 bucks for the car that you see here. And that's one thing with me. Like I'm not, I, I, I don't tell you the prices to try to brag I don't. I tell you the prices so that you know what what this cop what this hobby costs. Some people will appreciate it. Some people will say like, "Oh, you're you're trying to." Bra I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you what it costs. And I think it's a good idea that you tell people what things cost. You know, I'm, I, my kids, when it comes to money and finances, my kids know how much money I make. They know because it's important. I think that people can associate to have something like this. It costs that, and so. I've just never been that way. So sometimes you guys might hear me on the podcast, ask somebody what they paid for a car and you might think, oh, that's rude. Uh, I don't think it is, but again, we may be from different schools thought. So at any rate, I bought the Gia for 15 grand from Ross Wolf and it was, had a decent paint job, you know, for sure 10 footer, not bad. 
all the parts and pieces there, 15 grand, it was a deal. And I said, I'm just going to buy this Kia and just put it together and make a driver because I just want a nice, comfortable driver vehicle. And so that started the road down Zorba. Well, a couple years go through, the car's on my rack, I'm buying parts and pieces for it. But in the meanwhile, I'm getting other projects and sidetracked over here, sidetracked that way and all kinds of stuff going on. And so Andy comes here for one crazy weekend. I first meet Andy from just doing a podcast, just straight called him and said, hey, you're doing some cool stuff in the UK. Let's do a podcast. I did a podcast. I flew out there, met with him. We hung out and then uh, we became friends at that point. So the next year he comes out to one crazy weekend, has a blast. He's he's helps me clean my shop up and he's looking at this gear and he's like giving it the once over. And he says, you know, you ought to, you ought to send me this car and I'll just build it for you. And I said, yeah, I want to do it myself. He's like, it's been sitting here for a year since I've been here last time because now he's back the second time. He says, this car's now been here since I know you just shipped me the car. And I said, well, let me talk about it. So I talked it over with George. I talked it over with a bunch of people and I thought, you know what? We came up with this idea that I was going to ship him the car and he's going to go through it. And we're going to kind of just get it over there. He's going to give it the once over and finish the car for me, just time money type thing. And then I'd fly over there and take it on the Calvert Cruise and all that kind of stuff. Well, this is the beginning. This is the first version of that series of what's going to happen with that. So I think you guys will find that interesting. There's lots of uh, details that are going to be taking place in this. He's sending me updates daily on what he's doing. And in this video, we get to the third day that he's got the car. So we go over the process of the shipping and what it takes to get it there. And as you can see, you know, that whole process is going to be a bit involved. So I took some video that started back in November of 2013. And from that point, we'll start watching the videos so you guys can see what's happening. And we will, I'll catch up with you on the backside of these clips. Well, guys, the day's come. As you know, in my garage, I got a lot of projects, the Gia TC, Future Shock, Rag Chop, the Carbon Cab. I got all these cars. <clears throat> and when Andy was here during the One Crazy Weekend, he saw my Type 34 still on the rack that I had no time to fix. And he says to me, mate, send me the car so I can finish it. And then I thought, you know, that'd be super cool. Send the car out there, <sighs> debut it at Volksworld and uh, have a car to drive around. There's some events going on this year coming up. And I thought that'd be pretty rad to go do that and be a part of that. So that's what we're doing today. My car is loaded up on a trailer, headed for a container, and it's headed to England, headed to the United Kingdom. I'm piggybacking a container with uh, Russell Ritchie and uh, sending this dude over there. Pretty excited for it. Um, it's, I, you know, I really want to get the gear done. And, and my problem is, you guys all know, right? I'm three bolt Billy. I'll uh, start working on that thing. And next thing you know, you know, I'm close enough to getting it to driving it. I'm, I'm, I'm putting the double cab back together. My granddaughter gets in here and turns my turn signal switch all around, and the door was unlocked, and all kind of crazy stuff. But so, anyway, I uh, I'm pretty stoked to get this to go over there and and make this happen. So last night I loaded up the trailer, been doing a bunch of uh, preemptive stuff on the way to make things happen. So. Um, just making sure walk through the garage one last time, making sure I got all the last bits and pieces ready to go. Uh, these would be helpful, right? These dudes here. The steering rods that I asked my son to put in there the other day. So anyway, just doing the last walk through here in my garage as we head out to the truck and load, load her up. So there she is on the trailer, ready to go. We're hauling her down to uh, Paramount area. I know she looks close enough to get put together, but I thought it'd be cool to get it to Andy, have him finish it off. There's a lot of issues with the paint underneath, stuff like this, where, you know, there's that, there's some crinkles in these front, front wings right here. So my thought process was, you know, he saw the car here and he just said, He's like, dude, send me the car. So that's what we're doing. Sending it to him. George is too busy. George got so much going on at his shop. Between the other projects of mine, he's helping me with 
and my big thing is I just want to get these cars on the road, you know. So it's time to get this bad bird on the road, Cali bound. So hopefully not a lot of traffic. F1's about to start um, here in Vegas. So new truck to pull the rig. Yo, Zorba the Gia is on her way. We'll check back with you guys when we're on the road. Later. So we get down to Southern California. I stop by uh, SNS Air Cooled Parts and meet up with Steve Weidman because he's shipping some stuff for Russell as well. So I'm connecting with him and try to figure out the logistics and get it on the container. And then I get the address, load in a couple other things that Russell needs, and we head for the port. So after that, it's about a 20 minute drive, and the place is right across from Old Speed. Okay, that's it, guys. Just dropped off the. Uh... The Gia, so I know they're professional because she asked if it was the Carmen Gia. So it's here at the shipping port and uh, it's off to the UK. So next time we'll we'll probably see it be coming off the ship. So good luck later. So at this point, the car has been dropped off the shippers. It takes a few weeks to get things rolling and the car eventually gets on just sometime, maybe at the end of December, by January, it's in route. Uh, it eventually ends up at, ends up in the UK on March 8th. So it's a little bit behind schedule. Clearly we're not gonna make it for Volks World at this point. So, which was not a big deal. It was more cool for me to come in the summertime later on uh there's there, there was kind of a deadline but not really so anyway the car gets there to the uk and this is where we go from here she's here look thanks to russell and dan the car in his shop starts to inspect it checks it out goes through some of the parts, and then he's got to get to Voltrol to debut the new Type 34 Gia that he just finished this year. Monday morning, the car is back in the shop after Voltrol weekend. They finish inventorying a bunch of parts and pieces that I have, going through and separating things. They pull the body off the pan and then separate, uh, separate the two and put the chassis on or dolly, roll it around, get the pan prepped, go through and start inventorying a bunch of stuff. But here's the overall condition. Seems pretty solid. Pretty happy at this point. They start sending that stuff. Now he, he takes a heat gun and heats up all the Bondo and it makes the paint peel off pretty easy. Here's a shot of the Here's where he starts to sand and hits a little bit of filler in the driver's side front quarter. You can see it starts to get a little bit thicker, and then he starts scraping towards the bottom. Here's what you see on the front part. All that stuff's peeling off because there's all that mud work behind it. And then you look over here, this is the rear quarter, and as it gets a little lower, it starts to get a lot deeper, the mud's a little thicker, and they just keep going. Now you get to look at the rocker. So the rocker just literally had mud packed in it. Then I call Andy, we're on the phone. He's kind of giving me the walk around the car. And this is after he's got a bunch of the work started, looking at things, telling me, you know, it could be worse. That quarter over there is good. The rockers are solid on the insides. The outer rotters, the outer rockers are rotted a little bit. So those outer skins need to be replaced, plus the inner supports. Front nose seems fairly decent at this point, but they haven't gotten around to it. So this is just day one. You know, the backside of the front apron shows if there's any damage doesn't seem to have too much. So we just talk about a little bit of the additional work and he's, you know, after I'm seeing some of this mud work, I'm getting a little anxious, some hyperventilating, you know, and he's like, listen, don't get too worried about it. It could be way worse, but let's go through this thing and keep checking it out. And so this is still day one, just getting things prepped out and, you know, starting to go through the car, looking at some of the pieces. Tell me how thick that rear corner is. He can feel how thick it is. And then the the uh, 
the lower rockers seem to be decent, but when you look at the the pop outs where you can pull the spring plate out on the door sill as you come back to the quarter panel, you can see that those were just kind of mudded in, those rear circles. Now he's talking about the door uh, strikers section. He says that's pretty clean. The other side, but the driver's side's been built out with mud like a whole half inch in the rear quarter. So it's uh, one of those things where we're just kind of working through it little by little and I'm getting a little more apprehensive because I was hoping for a quick knock it down, spray it, and get it going. But unfortunately with these projects, it's never really that way. And I'm sure now by this point he's sensing my apprehension. He says, don't worry, you know, check out your, your hood, the deck lid. There's these little rust spots here. Other than that, you know, th these are rust spots that they painted over, right? Primer and painted right over rust spots. So now the hood's down to bare metal. They're checking all the parts and pieces. You know, it's reassuring me it's good. It's super solid. The hood, uh, the deck lid. But for the most part, the car needs, um, you know, he's going to get it stripped down the rest of the way tomorrow and let me know what he thinks. But he's, he's definitely reassuring me at this point that uh, not all is lost because, you know, when the car is on the other side of the world and we've now pulled the pin, there's no turning back at this point. So it gets a little uh, concerning when you start seeing all the mud, but he's like, I can't understand why they put so much bond on this car. It didn't need it. You know, it's just completely excessive. He tells you about the rear section of the car has been pounded pretty hard. That feels pretty thick with Bondo, he says. This thing's pretty rippled, and they've done a lot of mud work on the backside over here um, as he's looking at the back. So he's starting to get concerned once he's going to dig into that, but that'll be tomorrow's work where he digs into that. And we talk about maybe replacing that that rear uh, tail section. So he knows a guy that's got one, and so we'll wait to cross that bridge till we get to it. But at this point, he's really just assuring me, don't worry, not all is lost. We've gone through all your parts. Everything's been inventoried. That hits the body because the narrowed, we've got narrowed front trailing arms on there. So this is kind of what he's explained to me at this point is based on the narrowed arms that touches the body a bit. So no big deal. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but there's going to be some modifications made. He's gone ahead and gone through all my parts and pieces. As you can see in this image, you can see the narrowed front trailing arm. So Russell at Oldsfield narrows them an inch on each side so you can fit a little bit wider wheel in there and it tucks completely under the fender. So I'm excited for those because I like to run a, a bigger tire on the front so that everything fits nice and neat underneath the front wheel arches and uh, no concerns about that stuff. So he's talking about maybe we're going to do some air suspension on the front. This way it could sit low when it's parked and it can raise it up a little bit when it's driving. So we'll talk about a few of those things, keeping this stuff just doing some minor modifications and making sure everything's going to get going. So uh, day two, now it kicks off where he's sending me some pictures. It's about eight o'clock in the morning. He's sending me this, showing me the pictures of the rockers. And then he gives me the old taillight shot. When I see that, my heart sank. The amount of Bondo forming that taillight housing was just out of control. So he shows me both sides of the rockers. They've got the majority of the car stripped down, and here's how this looks. Since we're going to need a new tail panel, why not get an NOS one? I know a guy. That's lovely. So we cut all the old shit out of it. All right, I'm gonna leave that bit on until I get the new panel. But all this is cleaned up. This is the other still. And uh, so we can, the blaster can get to it all nicely. 
before we put all the new stuff back on. Come off. Off. What's that, mate? Feel up. <laughs> <laughs> so after they've got the rear tail section pulled off, they've got all the door hinges, hood, deck lid, glove box, all that stuff pulled off and ready to blast and put an epoxy primer. So the glove box door the hood, the deck lid, all that stuff get taken to bare metal, all the rust pieces pulled out, and then they epoxy prime them right away so that he can start to do a little bit of body work. So he's got the roof strip now, and everything's, for the most part, is I'm feeling a little bit better because he's gone around the whole car and it's not a total waste. So there's the old tail section. That just had filler in it. Just caught his lovely lip. Obviously, I've done the same here, cut it all open. That'll be done. Thought the panel's good. Front end's beautiful, no rust at all. So, it's not that bad, mate. Now, as you can see where they're getting into with the car, the car's all down to metal. They've got some pieces done. I've got a NOS tail panel on order thanks to russell ritchie appreciate it brother for hooking me up with that um you know where else could i get an nos tail panel from on such short notice then mario steinhauser's connecting us with some of the rocker bits and pieces like that so pretty stoked to be pulling this thing together uh, lots of parts and things are, are happening that whole tail light thing scared the crap out of me because i thought we were gonna have to rebuild the whole structure but luckily uh, with the resources uh, that Andy has and a lot of guys in the UK that are in the restoration business, they were able to put the pieces together that I needed for the metal. So we're just waiting on that. The car got shipped off to the blasters. Next episode, we'll see it back from the blasters to see what's left. Now, one of the interesting things that, that Andy does is with that heat gun. So you saw him scraping the paint. Now, what he does, he uses a heat gun to heat up the paint, heats up the filler behind it, and he uses a flat blade just to scrape the filler and the paint off the car as much as he can. So this way the blaster doesn't have to sit there and just keep wearing away at the panel and getting them all rippled. So he gets the car as down to bare metal as he can, where he can, so that way the blaster has to do the least amount of work and avoid warping some of those panels. So until next episode, guys, stay tuned. The car will get back from blasters. Then we'll see how quickly the metal pieces and parts come together. And if you're liking this video, make sure you guys subscribe and like, hit the comment button if you want to say something below about the process. Let me know what you think. Uh, Type 34 Gears are definitely a unique car. A uh, little over 42,000 of them built. I think they're one of the more rare cars, more rare than a split window, that's for sure. And uh, count how many you see at the next car show you go to. Uh, this could be turning into the year of the Type 34 Gia. So anyway, guys, uh, I've got a laundry list of stuff to go on the next on the next episode i'll have the list of stuff that i didn't send that i had here with my second type 34 gear that's right when you got one you always get another one so i have a second type 34 karma gear and i had some parts that i didn't send so i'll be sending those off in the mail shipping those out this week so anyway guys thanks for watching i appreciate it and uh again share like and subscribe and help the channel grow sooner or later be off the paint wait to see what color we're painting it Part two Zorba up next.